Hello everybody, thank you for joining me today and in today's video we're going to be focusing upon the high yield questions which present for children presenting with a limp in medical school final exams. So just a little bit of information about the Medicine Guide. So the Medicine Guide is a YouTube channel focused on supporting medical school students throughout their entire journey and course. So I've made a series focusing on how to be successful at medical school, such as how to be successful in the pre-clinical years, how to be successful during the clinical years, how to get the most out of GP placements, how to get the most out of hospital placements, and also how to succeed in your clinical OSCEs. I've also created a paediatrics edition. So I've got videos on the high yield child with a mass for finals, high yield rashes for finals, high yield genetic conditions for finals, high yield congenital heart diseases for finals, high yield vomiting child for finals. So please, please, please can I ask you to give me a thumbs up if you enjoy my video today. Please can I ask you to subscribe to my YouTube channel and please can you support me by sharing my video with your friends and I would also like to encourage you to write a few comments in the comment section. Let me know if there's anything that you didn't like about today's video, anything that you think I can improve on. So without much further ado, let's get started. So the outline of today's video is that I'm going to discuss developmental dysplasia of the hip, Perthes disease, septic arthritis, transient arthritis, and slipped upper femoral epiphysis because these are the high yield typical exam questions which you'll find in your medical school exams. Also, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, so AIL, is the most common leukemia found in children. Also, it commonly leads to a child presenting with a limp. However, I have discussed this in my previous video called High Yield Child with a Mass for Finals. So I would encourage you to look at that video just for completion. So with that to mind, let's get started. So firstly, I'm going to start off by talking about developmental dysplasia of the hip. So this is a situation where the femoral head hasn't properly articulated with the hip. So this means that the femoral head doesn't lie completely within the acetabulum of the hip and so therefore it's easily dislocated as such. So risk factors for developmental dysplasia of the hip involves the four Fs, so a firstborn child, a female, family history of developmental dysplasia of the hip and foot first, so a breech presentation. So when you're reading the stem or when you're revising about developmental dysplasia of the hip, just remember the four Fs are the key risk factors for developmental dysplasia of the hip. So a child will present with delayed walking and a painless limp. They will have asymmetrical skin folds. So the leg that's been affected by developmental dysplasia of the hip, that leg will have extra skin folds present. Also, Alice sign will be obvious, so that leg or hip that's affected will have a shorter appearance because the hip muscles will undergo atrophy, so that's why that particular leg will appear slightly shorter. So in terms of tests, so development to say the hip should be identified during the routine NIPE screening. So when a child is born, they have that initial newborn screening examination, that's known as the NIPE screening examination. So as part of the NIPE screening examination, the Barlow and Ortolani test are performed, and this helps to identify children who have development to displays in the hip. So in the Barlow test, this is when the healthcare professional will try to dislocate an articulated hip. And if you look at the picture below, it shows you how they were able to do so. And then after performing the Barlow test, then the Ortolani test is performed. And this is when healthcare professionals try to relocate a dislocated hip and the hip returns back into the acetabulum with a very loud, obvious clunk sound. So please refer to the pictures in the bottom right hand corner for further clarification about this. 
Okay. Now your ultrasound screening test is your gold standard test that's performed for development of displays of the hip. Now x-rays are considered first line if the child is above four and a half months years of age. Okay. In intensive management, we offer children a pavlic harness initially, and then combined femoral and pelvic osteotomies are performed for more older children. So the key features to remember about developmental displays of the hip is that risk factors involve the 4F, firstborn child, female, family history of developmental displays of the hip, foot first, so breach, presentation and delivery. The signs are that they have delayed walking, painless limp, they will have one leg that appears shorter than the other. An intensive test, your ultrasound is the gold standard and the Barlow test and Autolani test are performed as part of the NIP screening test to identify children affected with developmental display of the hip and a pavlic harness is used as part of management. Now, I've highlighted some pieces of text in purple and that's to emphasize that these are the high yield phrases or buzzwords which will help you to remember development of space of the hip and also you need to be aware of these tests and you also need to be familiar with the term public harness because this is something that is commonly asked at medical school final exams okay so now we're going to focus on Perthes disease so Perthes disease is essentially an avascular necrosis of the femoral head so this means that the femoral head has become flattened and fragmented, so it's unable to smoothly rotate in the acetabulum, and this restricts the child's movement and mobility. So one key feature to remember of Perthes disease, amongst other key features, is that Perthes disease begins with a P. So because it begins with a P, you should think automatically that Perthes disease will affect children of a primary school who of a primary school age. So these children will be between the ages of five to 10. So I've highlighted Perthes disease initially with a P in a green font and also primary with again a green font to help you remember that Perthes disease affects primary school children. So these patients will complain of a hip pain which is then referred to the ipsilateral thigh or knee this pain is worse with activity, worse with exercise, and they have pain especially on hip abduction and medial rotation, okay? So in terms of tests, an X-ray will present with increased density in the femoral epiphysis. So I, I understand that's quite a mouthful, but if you have a look in the lower right corner of the screen, you can see an X-ray of a patient with Perthes disease and I hope you can appreciate that the femoral head appears quite irregular, it appears almost quite crushed and fragmented and that helps to emphasise that the femoral head has undergone avascular necrosis so that's why it's got this irregular crushed or fragmented architecture. Okay so the management of this disease Sorry, the management of this disease varies on the child's age. So if the child is under the age of six, we just offer analgesia, bracing, and we observe the child. If the child is above the age of six, then we can offer surgical repair. So that's quite important. So to quickly summarize, Perthes disease affects children of a primary school age. They have hip pain, worse on hip abduction and medial rotation. X-rays are needed and the management will vary upon the child's specific age. Okay? So now we're moving on to septic arthritis. So septic arthritis is very, very important. It's a rheumatological emergency and you need to know this inside out essentially for your exams. So risk factors of septic arthritis involves osteomyelitis. So osteomyelitis is when you've got an infection of the long bone and as a consequence of this long bone infection, it can then spread into the joints and therefore lead to septic arthritis. Other risk factors involve sickle cell anemia, diabetes, and an immunocompromised patient. So children with septic arthritis will have this very sudden acute painful joint 
Unfortunately, they will be unable to bear weight on that joint. The child will experience pain both at rest and during exercise, and they will also have a very, very, very high fever. Now, if you have a look at the diagram on the right, you can see that the child has a very red, swollen joint. And this helps to emphasize that in septic arthritis, the particular joint that's affected will appear very hot and warm to the touch. It'll look red and quite angry. So that's why you need to be aware that these patients will have a very high fever. And also, if you have a look on the picture, you can see that the child's leg is held flexed, abducted and externally rotated. And these are key buzzwords that you need to know for your SBAs. And also there's a mention of pseudoparalysis. So that means that the hip is held flexed and there's no spontaneous movement at all. So don't forget that the child is in an, an excruciating amount of pain, both at rest and this is made worse with activity. So the child will try to resist any sort of movement at all. So they'll be holding their hip in this similar fashion and they'll be avoiding any spontaneous movement. So that's why it's described as a pseudo paralysis because the hip is held in a fixed flex position. OK. So we need to perform ultrasound guided joint aspiration and that fluid is then sent away for gram staining and gram culturing to find out which specific underlying bacterial or viral infection is causing the septic arthritis and then blood cultures as well just to see what the child's systemic well-being is like to make sure that the infection hasn't traveled systemically that it's just localized to that particular joint at the moment so in terms of management we give joint aspiration to patients and we give IV flucoxacillin for four to six weeks but if patients suffer from a penicillin allergy they can receive IV clindamycin. So key features to remember about septic arthritis is that children will have a very sudden hot swollen joint pain both at rest and this is worse during exercise they'll have pseudo paralysis they will hold their hip in a flexed, abducted and externally rotated position, they'll have a very, very high fever. We have to perform ultrasound guided joint aspiration and in terms of management, we'll continue the joint aspiration and give four to six weeks of IV antibiotics. OK. So looking at transient synovitis, this is inflammation of the synovium, so the lining of the joint capsule as such. So in terms of signs, there'll be an acute limp similar to septic arthritis. However, in transit synovitis, it's not necessarily an emergency situation where septic arthritis is definitely a life-threatening emergency, so you need to act far more quickly. In transient synovitis, the child will have a mild or absent fever, whereas in septic arthritis, the child will have a very, very high fever. So transient synovitis, the patient will be in tremendous amount of pain only on exercise and they'll be comfortable at rest. Whereas in septic arthritis, we thought the child is in pain both at rest and during exercise. Also in transient synovitis, the child will have limited internal rotation and that's something you really need to be aware of for your exams. So the exact cause of transient synovitis is unknown. It's thought that it's due to a viral infection. Now in terms of tests, transient synovitis is a diagnosis of exclusion so nothing can be used to confirm the condition but what we can do is that we can perform all of the following tests to help exclude septic arthritis to exclude all the other pathologies and once all the other pathologies are excluded then we can consider transient synovitis so that's what the phrase diagnosis of exclusion is referring to so in terms of management, we give NSAIDs and that usually helps to resolve transient synovitis. Now, in medical school final questions, they will often have a question where you're considering if the condition is due to transient synovitis or septic arthritis. Now, I've gone through some of the 
key discriminating features, but I want to emphasize is that in such arthritis, a child will look very, very obviously unwell. But in transient synovitis, the child will look quite well regardless. So slipped upper femoral epiphysis, so slipped upper femoral epiphysis, so I've highlighted the letter S because this particular condition is commonly found in secondary school children. So think slipped upper femoral epiphysis begins with an S, found in children who are of a secondary school age. Perthes disease begins with a P, affects children who are of a primary school age. Okay, and another risk factor for slipped upper femoral epiphysis is that uh, it affects overweight children. So initially the child will present with a stiff hip and this pain will then radiate to the thigh or the knee and this pain will cause the child to present with an externally rotated hip and an, and an antalgic gait. Now slipped upper femoral epiphysis is quite dangerous because if you look at the top right hand picture, you can see that the femoral head, the epiphysis, has almost slipped off and has fragmented off the growth plate, the physis. So that's the sort of picture that I want you to keep in your mind when you're considering this disease. Okay, so in terms of tests, we need to do an x-ray and a frog lateral view of both hips and that's diagnostic. So again, be really, really aware of this because you could quite easily have a question in your exam asking you to identify which test is used to diagnose slipped up or femoral epiphysis. And if that's the situation that you're in, then automatically go to x-rays and frog lateral views. OK. And if you have a look at the x-ray in the bottom right hand corner, you can see how the physis is slipped off from the femoral head. So the femoral head itself is quite smooth in its architecture and you can see that it's maintained its consistency. The difference is that the physis and the femoral head has, has it appears almost like two structures that's separated. Now, if you go back to Perthes disease, the femoral head is very irregular in its architecture. It looks crushed, it looks fragmented. So that's another way that you can use to help discriminate between Perthes disease and slipped upper femoral epiphysis if you've got an imaging question for instance look at the femoral head look at the shape of it is it smooth is it intact yes okay more likely to be slipped up a femoral epiphysis as opposed to Perthes disease all right and in terms of management we need to immediately refer to orthopedics and internal fixation is needed all right so I just wanted to say thank you for watching my video today. I know I know it's been quite a long video, um, but I'd just like to say thank you for watching my video. And if you've enjoyed my video, then please, please do give me a thumbs up, subscribe to my YouTube channel, share my video amongst your friends, and I wish you all the best for your exams. Thank you very much.